In June of 2019, uh, the following was approved. Um, we began work on the needs assessment report, uh, which we completed in 2019. Uh, included in that, we submitted 12 applications. Again, thanks to uh, Donna and Marcia for, for letting us know about the uh, School Revolving Renovation Fund. Um, 12 applications totaling $988,000 in change uh, to the state of Maine for approval to try to address uh, certain uh, very specific items that are required by the state. We couldn't really go for the large <coughs> projects. They all had to be $1 million or less or so. Um, and then between the fall of 2019 and winter 2020, here we are, where we've been reviewing needs assessment and we're talking about sort of what are, what are the next steps and what's the path forward here. Um, and what we'd like to start in our presentation is a question that was raised last time that we had met. And what are sort of the big differences between a new construction and a renovation in place? Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, speak to uh, uh, speak to that topic. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? You're gonna have to really speak up. Okay. okay. Can you hear me across the room? Great. The uh, so. Uh, when we first uh, were hired, we came on, looked at the schools, looked at the grounds, took everything into account, spoke to the teachers, did some interviews, spoke to the manager. They provided a lot of information. And we have looked at, um, too loud. <laughs> we have looked at uh, renovation of the existing buildings versus new construction. I kind of wanted to go through some of the, the pluses and minuses of each one. Um, starting with renovation, um, Based on the way the schools are situated, in order to renovate any of the schools, you basically have to move the students out into temporary trailers or in temporary schools, rent another space. We did actually do a um, somewhat exhaustive uh, study of whether or not if you could do a three-month summer plan to turn various parts of the school over to the contractor for three months of the summer. Give them the school, take it back. Give them the school, take it back. Um, <clears throat> when you have, uh, what happens is contractors have mobilization, demobilization costs, and those <coughs> are up. They leave things partially done, have to pick them up later on. We didn't think that was a big advantage. Um, another part of the renovation, using if we were to renovate the schools, is we would still lose part of the athletic fields to contractor lay down space. When you hire a contractor to come do work for you, whether it's in your yard or it's a big commercial project, they need lay down space. If we force them to rent that or haul in or have staging yards that are way off site, it just drives up the cost. So we, it would still be better to have it on an athletic field. Um, the HVAC system, Perry did a wonderful job uh, a couple meetings ago of talking about the design of these masonry masonry buildings where the slab is exposed, so if you're sitting next to the edge of the, any of the per perimeter parts of these schools, you're going to be uncomfortably cold at the bottom, even if there's wall heat, you know, radiant heat on the wall pumping up towards you, or blowing heat down on you. How does that manifest itself? Well, if you're uncomfortable in your work environment or in your learning environment, you're only going to pay attention for about 20 minutes max, and then you're going to just be too uncomfortable to move forward. It's, it's you're going to be more concentrating on how do I get warm or how do I get not warm, uh, you know, cooled off. So uh, HVAC would not be completely fixed as part of an HVAC in the renovated project. Um, the first bullet there, unanticipated discoveries in the construction world, they call that unforeseen conditions. No matter how many ceiling tiles we've pulled up, no matter how much we've tried to look and find everything, there are things behind the walls of every single building, whether it's your home, or my home, or a commercial building, and those drive up the cost. And so what happens is when we're doing planning for a major renovation, the contingencies are higher. When a contingency is high, you get less built because you're waiting for those unforeseen things to happen. And they're everything from, well, we thought we were going to reuse these heaters, they're too corroded, the pipes are too filled with, when we cut into the pipes, the water was too hard, and now we have to replace all this pipe. There's a contingency for that, and that doesn't translate itself into a new building. It translates into itself, itself into paying a contractor to fix something that we didn't see. Um, one of the main things that we talked about, uh, both with you folks and in our group, um, with the architects and, and engineers, is 
The buildings are, especially the, the uh, front building and middle school, are quite old. To do what's necessary to do significant, uh, to make the security concerns go away, would be a lot of work that most likely, if you're going to do something major to these buildings in the next few years, which we're recommending, that would be throwing good money out of the bat. We could fix it. We can create the security boundaries that are needed. Not a lot of that would be saved as you move ahead. Some of it can, um, depending on the direction that you choose. Um, with the new construction, in the way that we foresee it happening, there would not be any temporary teaching facilities required, so no trailers. Um, we've come up with a phased plan for recommending where open field would be used to, just to, to create a building, part of a new school, move students into that, tear down what's there, build a new school there, combine it together, and the school, the, the students are always in a classroom that is meant for teaching. Uh, are the athletics folks here tonight? Or just, we're, still, we're still showing the athletics field um, going away in the, in the area directly adjacent to the, the middle school. Um, we do believe that there's enough site and grounds here to bring some of that back. Um, we don't know in what form yet. But, uh, and, yeah, and the construction would be phased to minimize school disruption. There's some construction would be going on while school is in session. Um, that can be minimized. There's ways to do that. Um, we've had really good success having contractors um, you know, do most of their demolition and the really loud stuff after, say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon and do more of the quiet, quiet type work in the morning. It does work. We've done it ourselves at our company and we've had good luck with it. So uh, you can phase that so that you can be teaching and having construction. Last slide, um, the new construction, I'm going to cover this a little bit later with the actual energy, but the, the new construction allows for maximum energy savings, taking advantage of all the sustainability and all the new construction techniques to maximize keeping heat in and hold out and vice versa in the sun. Um, Scott Simon stood up, I think he was at the last meeting of the meeting before, and talked about the new teaching methods, higher ceilings that are needed, more flexible spaces that are required. A new build, a new construction is going to give you that much more teaching flexibility. And then, of course, the security concerns. A new school is going to have all of the new security that, that all the new schools have these days. And, and really need I want to sort of touch on what you just read uh, Scott's previous comments. Um, here we have a situation where this building has been built over six different phases. And to a certain degree, you've adapted your teaching to the space. This is an opportunity to adapt your space to your teaching method. You can have a purpose-built facility that is designed for your specific teaching philosophy. It's a great opportunity to just sort of rethink the school and how it works. So that's one of the major benefits of the new construction. So with that, I uh, want to sort of transition uh, more towards the sounds that I've had to talk about sort of the his bonding history of the town of Gable has been a So uh, I'm just going to uh, What we have here is uh, one of the larger questions that has come up numerous times is what's the ability to pay when you do like that? No options that do come from uh, come from all these areas that they're considering for reconstruction, renovation, hybridized approach. Uh, but it all comes down to how much is that actually is the appetite for the town to take on that as well as its ability to pay and how long they want to pay that for. Uh, so what I did was I took the chance to, or took the opportunity to speak with our uh, gentleman that does the majority of our bond syndication in Morrison County out of Boston. And I asked him and that I reviewed our most recent bond issuance. And so what we have here is kind of a, this is a, a spreadsheet that kind of breaks down what our current bond, bond and debt situation is, as well as uh, there are some legal parameters that we need to consider. Uh, so what we'll see, I guess a couple things I want to lay out first. There are statutory limits, there are legal limits that have been set by the state to the amount of debt that a town can take on when it comes to doing projects. Uh, what you see on, on this one right here, um, it comes down to uh, 
equalized state valuation. So what we have here, this is our advancing state valuation over here, starting in 2012 through 16, and then fast forward to today, 2020. Our current state valuation is $2.125 billion. So uh, the state has set a limit for all debt that a town can take. You can exceed, you cannot exceed 15%. So that's, that's your ceiling. What does that mean as far as real numbers? It means that the town cannot exceed $318,780 million in debt, on debt. Where are we at now? Uh, currently, school, town, sewer debt, we're $15,700,000 in debt. That is roughly three quarters of 1% of what our state equalized valuation is. So it's three quarters of 1% of the 2.185 or per capita is another way to look at it. So for the 9,015, which is our last, cent, uh, last census number, we have a per capita debt of $1,742 now. So that's kind of our baseline where we're at now. There is some debt that's expiring, and I'll touch on that shortly. Uh, but when we're looking at some of the statutory or legal requirements or legal limits, they also have some language related specifically to school debt, or school related debt. The limit by the statute is 10% of its last state full valuation. So obviously you take 10% of the 2.125. So for school related debt, you can't exceed $212 million in, in debt. Our current school debt service, or 10% there. Uh, per capita, this, this will choke you. Uh, for the 318 million, it's 35,361. Uh, for the 212, it's 23,574. Obviously, that's either one of those approaches is the equivalent of taking all your equity out of your house, taking your kids' college fund, taking all your hard-earned money, putting it all the center of the table. Uh, that's and there's a reason why there's a limit because it's not fiscally responsible. Now, our current school debt service is very attractive. We're two tenths of one percent, four million three hundred twenty-two thousand dollars, two hundred in current debt. Or $479 per capita. Our current town, uh, town debt and sewer debt service, now we do include sewer here because it is bonded debt. Okay? The sewer debt service is pretty much paid for by the sewer, the sewer fees that the users pay on a, you know, on a monthly basis, uh, but still it's included in there. Uh, but we're still looking at just under six tenths of 1% as uh, our current town and sewer debt, or $1,262 per capita. Now, speaking with Joe, when he goes out and syndicates these on a daily basis, what's an acceptable amount to the market? So when they are looking at syndicating these bonds and to find out allocating risk and keep, because we have this type of position here, we've done very well for a long time as a AAA bond rating and a AA1 bond rating. Uh, we are among the best, if not the best in the state, as far as uh, risk that uh, we're, we're, we're calculated. It comes down to our uh, debt related to where we're at our ability to pay. So looking at a couple of things that, you know, looking at Joe, he had a couple of areas he looked at, $3,000 to $4,000 range is what they're looking at, is what the market may find acceptable uh, to a town, as well as what generally they found has been acceptable to the public, as far as what they may support through a ballot initiative. As well as 2% uh, if you're looking at in relationship to uh, equalized state valuation. Those are kind of the areas that folks seem to seem to approve uh, historically. So that would be at this point at three thousand dollars per capita. You're looking at about twenty-seven million dollars in bond debt, and so that would give us, if you look at our uh, current debt service, fifteen seven subtracted from twenty-seven gives you about twelve million dollars right now on the low end, and then three thousand dollars. 36,000, I'm sorry, 36 million on the higher end, like 4,000 per capita. So that gives you about 21 million in, in gap right now. Uh, and then if you look at the 2% as another estimated number to use, you look at about 42.5 uh, million as far as almost your, your ceiling as to where you want to be. So we're buying about 27 million right now, uh, or $4,714 per, uh, per capita. So then uh, right now, this is kind of a, a bigger picture of the smaller picture you just saw. Uh, 
Uh, Nearly as funny as I said. So you look at your total debt limit, that one again is about 318. Uh, for the schools, you're looking at 212 is the, uh, is the, is the ceiling. Uh, our current town and sewer is 1.3, and our current school is 4.3. And then looking at our per capita, so we have there 479 currently for the school and 1262 on the town side. And then the 4714 would be that. Uh, that that uh, two percent area that you're looking at as far as what the market may find in second. Uh, now, uh, looking at some of what we have done in the future, yeah, anytime. Back to the last slide, we saw trying to understand this. So, if the town were to spend what you put out as the maximum, forty-two million, we would be increasing the debt. Good question. That would be. I just want to make sure I'm understanding that. Sure. It would be about, about three and a half times what we're currently at. Right now, our, our per capita total is 1,742. So it's the four, seven, nine, plus 1,262. Okay. So it's three times. Yeah. So it's, three times. So it's about three, three and a half times. Yes, that. Appreciate that. For sure. And uh, so, so what we've done in the past, uh, this, these are our current bonds we have out now. Uh, School of Public Works goes back to 1999. We're at 2.899 right now. Uh, some of these are quickly going to be retired. School uh, of Public Works, Public Safety, uh, Miscellaneous, those in the previous generation are due to come off in fairly short order uh, from, from the town's books. Uh, when they come up on 20 years, some of them will refinance back in. Uh, about halfway through, about 10 years in, to get a better rate as well as uh, help the town. So uh, that debt is coming off. So over the next couple of years, the amount that the town will be able to is like, if you think about that 42 number versus the 15, that 27 difference between the, the two starts to grow. So over time, you start to be able to have a little bit more capacity to be able to do that. Uh, but historically, what the town has done is invested very well in its, in its infrastructure. Uh, with, Full of public works, we have a brand new public works facility, or new to most. Uh, the public safety building is also goes back to my first year here. Uh, community center renovation happened uh, year after. Uh, did do some infrastructure improvement that took place back in 2006. Uh, and then town center roads, there's some additional investment that had taken place. Uh, most recently, we're looking at the TNL, or the most recent bond initiative that took place with the public library was done, and then the pool and the recycling center uh, took place three years ago. So uh, all those have gone please hold on, I'm looking at now. So the one, the one area that we're looking at, the, the existing debt that we do have, some of it is coming off, the debt that we do have that will go on for a longer time beyond that. It's not a, many of those are long windows that we do still have operating with it, but they're also more uh, so debt, so blending environment still positive as far as that goes with the interest rate dynamic that we have to play. But uh, hopefully this gives you a better picture as to what, you know, when you're looking at the capacity for the town, I know, you know, we may accept the discussion as far as what the, the committee decides to make for recommendation as far as the options that are out there. So uh, I'm happy to answer any, any, any more questions or others come up. Don't hesitate to give me an email or I'll do this. I can respond to it. Is the town anticipating any new issues which take into consideration the The upcoming items that we have, the big ticket items, probably uh, Shore Road is in the near, is in the near future, as far as a larger, larger ticket item. Uh, we have done it in the past two years, the past three years we've done two different lease purchase agreements in, uh, in 1.3, 1.5, million dollar range. Those retire fairly quickly. So those are five years or less, uh, one of which has uh, two years after this year, or uh, four. So those retire fairly quickly, and those are those are built into the tax rate. So instead of putting a higher impact on either one of the tax rate or the other, those are uh, you take for us.
These amounts here, those are those were the those are the original amounts that they were issued at. Those aren't the current balances. No, those aren't the current balances. Yes. And we have to share that. I, I don't know. Yeah, those those are all those are all down. And so, what are the maturities of these? Of this debt typically is it five years? Is it ten years? Is it twenty? And the age of the job? Most of those are twenties. Twenty. Yeah, most of those are twenties. And then the police purchase items are the twenty bonds. But most of them are the twenty bonds. And then the a couple different times uh, due to economic uh, times, they've refunded us after 10 years. So we've looked at that a couple different times over the past few years. Joe keeps trying to give you a uh, refinance debt, but it hasn't made sense. Most people live with, uh, with Jim Sapp, and there's a lot of council. The uh, small amounts of the city refinance. Well, not only well below, but one of the highest rankings in the state in terms of staying below our locations, if not the highest. We're doing really well. Good. 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 It's not that we're borrowing a lot less than other people necessarily. We just have a better capacity of pay. Well, we're really... It's like a credit score. Yeah. It's like a FICO score. Okay. Like. We're, as far as related to other, other communities, like Garment, for instance, the community last year took on like a $68 million amount of debt uh, to this case. So the yeah. numbers changed pretty dramatically uh, where it came. So we're, we're extremely... This is about as low as you're probably going to find for many times. It's just because of where we're, most of it is where we're at in relationship, especially to where, what our uh, state equalized valuation is. Well, if you look at that, we have to spend a lot of money on our schools. Yeah. Right. Well, some of that's been, yeah, and a lot of that the entire would be your school, so. Matt, we also have money set aside, almost like a surplus that we set aside, we, bu we budget for and set aside a certain amount of money, almost like a rainy day fund to, Keep that rating rating as high as we are. Is that yeah, another factor? Fund balance is healthy. Fund balance is healthy. That helps us out a lot as well. And all that comes into play. We, uh, we're about to call a great audit. That helps. Uh, we pay our bills. We don't have a lot of debt. Things that, you know, all those come into play that help us. As, as Council Garden said, uh, it's really we would down. have almost like the, the, the diamond. So if you wait to where if we have to really change that at all, we'd have to pay more. Yeah, but because of where we've done historically, that's why we uh, get our ratings that we have. Uh, we need to be very well compared to other towns that are that don't have much to do. Do you have any sense of what the average household pays? Uh, per household pays to, 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 to find it? To pay the, yeah. Right now where we are? Yeah, it's uh, that's per So if you Yeah. <laughs> 
tax bill, so I'm trying to figure out first what the low hanging fruit is here. So over the next over the next two years, roughly about five hundred seventy-five thousand dollars combined uh, will be dropping off of our debt service. So this year, uh, for instance, we made the last payment on uh, on the pool of public works bond. So that's going to take two hundred eighty-nine dollars, uh, two hundred eighty-nine thousand uh, in debt service off, and then. Next year's budget, we're looking at dropping 205000 And then two years out, we're looking at community services, it's going to drop about $78,000 off. So that, that's, that's the, uh, the bottom of the average right there. So, doing some quick math, that might support $9 million of borrowing? Roughly. Mm -hmm. No impact. Over three years, yeah. It's kind of like when, to that map. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like when the county did the uh, city center over. Yeah. At the same time, they dropped the debt. Uh, they dropped the bond from the uh, from the jail. They came out at the same time and they, and they did the city center over. Like, hey, no impact the tax. And that's one of the things we did with some of the last school borrowing was as early as Friday night school started to come out. Yeah. That gives you the ability to follow us to phase things in as far as improvements go. You can look at that and you know, paste that in as your debt was retired and paste other improvements in. So the first 
point, I'll talk about the first point up here about the state support for funding. Can everybody hear me okay? Am I projecting loudly enough? Oh. You're perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about this first. There was an article, um, thank you for sharing, Marianne, this weekend that um, touched a little bit on this, and I don't know if y'all had a chance to read that yet. The article um, states that Pine Tree Watch reports that in the last two decades, Districts have sought help with nearly 260 of the state's 600 or so buildings, and only 75 new schools have been approved, including just 19 since 2010. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit. When we went to, we met with the state director for major capital construction in November, and Ann Panette indicated at this time they are closed for applications for this type of process at this time. However, she said, keep your eyes open. Um, at any time, the state budget can release funds, the federal government can release funds. More than likely, it will be a few years, but you never know, so we're gonna keep our eyes open. But right now, for applying for any major capital money, the application process is closed. And the we are still in the process. We'll know February 1st, you all remember that part, that we have six projects that are being seriously considered, um, but they're not. For major renovations, but it would be six projects, that would be great. We have a 30% forgiveness rate. But I wanted to also talk about the name rate. Susanna did great research, and I wanted to review some of that for your presentation. Um, just a, some facts from our surrounding schools. So our neighboring school, South Portland, did receive $59 million from the state recently um, that, for a $69 million project. And Westbrook completed in 2010 a $29 million project on the middle school with 90% that was state funded. Falmouth completed construction in 2011 on a new green elementary school for $37.7 million that was 83% state funded. And the, the Falmouth taxpayers for that project paid $6 million to complete it. So, you know, good news and bad news as far as the state funding goes. Excellent. Thank you much, I really appreciate that. Um, so again, talking at a high level, we're gonna sort of break down to the ground level a little bit with the next one. Um, Julia here is gonna talk about uh, sort of square footage analysis um, of all the schools here on the campus. I'm trying to make this large enough so that you can see by the way, just in case you can, because it is actually a little bit hard to see. We did um, take a quick path in trying to look at the programmatic comparisons between the high school and the elementary <coughs> school, middle school, and the COVID building, just to answer the question. Um, you know, we couldn't determine the this approach is going to be for a number of reasons, but essentially just breaking it down into six categories of admin support, classroom, gymnasium, media center, library, cafeteria, and then auditorium. Um, the elementary middle school building is shown in blue, the high school is shown in orange. So as far as administrative support, they're fairly similar. We were surprised to find that the elementary middle school actually had a significantly higher amount of square footage program dedicated to classroom space at um, almost 57,000, which is 56,700. And the uh, high school was at 47, 34, 340, sorry. Um, the gym was actually fairly comparable. Uh, the space assigned to media center or library, depending on the building and cultural different things, was fairly comparable. Cafeteria. Um, this one was a little is a little bit um, misleading because, of course, the elementary, middle school, the cafeteria, and the auditorium are combined into one thing. Um, but so we don't actually have a dedicated auditorium space here. So this is actually where the high school really um, has a significant amount of additional square footage because it has a completely separate dedicated space for that. Um, so. Just to give you a sense of where the total square footage per student stands compared to the main state Department of Education guidelines, if you were designed 
from scratch today. The elementary, middle school came out to 204. The high school came out to 311. Um, and one of the reasons for that, despite the fact that uh, in some ways it, the, uh, it, it seems like it would be opposite compared to the actual total square footage of the buildings, but then it comes down to the per student um, and the ratios are actually different. So the NDOE guideline for elementary school students equate to 140 square feet per student, and for high school it's 185 square feet per student. So these are baseline recommendations. You may think we're doing really well because our per student square footage is significantly higher, but the reality is that these figures don't actually account for efficiency of design and layout. And so we've heard a lot from faculty um, and so forth that a lot of the spaces don't actually feel like they work very well, even though from a number standpoint, it looks like you're doing really well for a square foot per student ratio. Is there anyone in the room that can remind me of the number of students per school? It's five. I mean, I, I think my guess is, and what I understand is, it's 100 to 130 or 40 per grade. It's about that. So the elementary and middle school would be two thirds of the school population already, right? So the, the, you're saying that here. Yeah. And if you looked in the previous slides, you can see how it's a little unbalanced. Right, they account for a lot less than two. There's not a two thirds or a third difference between us. And, and part of that is because between the different age groups, um, the required division of the actual square footage that you would allot to the different number of students is actually different. Does that make sense? Two minutes. Yes. Um, I'm assuming that this is somewhat in response to my question of is it actually feasible <laughs> yes. to repurpose the high school. Exactly. I had already guessed it wasn't, and so I just I think that some clarity around what you're selling would be useful to the community, which is it isn't. Yes. Like, there's been a lot of questions about square footage and right sizing, and there's just a bunch of other ways to say it. And I think the general feeling of our team was that if you redesign the schools new, there would be there would be some conservation of space. We're not quite sure how much, but we do believe that the number the overall square footage would probably come down for both schools. It's very early. It's very early in the, in the process to, to figure out what that might be, but this shows shows you that you have a lot of space um, and remind and, and it's a reminder for the future energy piece that's coming up is Every square foot we save on a, on a new design is just a square foot we don't have to heat and Perry doesn't have to take care of. So. Okay, well, case in point, in this facility, there are portions of the building that are unusable. We counted them in the square footage, <coughs> but they can't be for code reasons. So going forward, again, with more of the sustainability things with new design, there's a, also a question previously about new design methods for building materials. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail also. So sustainability is a really broad topic, but so we wanted to sort of give you an introduction of what the possibilities would be for new construction. And we divided this into six different categories. And those six different categories sort of correspond to lead certification. The first one is location and transportation, you know, basic principles like positioning buildings next to public transport, um, you know, electric charging stations and so forth. Sustainable sites that use native materials and are low impact uh, development methods. Um, the next slide. And then the category of water efficiency, taking the advantage of uh, rainwater harvesting and using that rainwater for uh, flushing and for irrigation, incorporating low flow toilets that uh, conserves water. Uh, the next category was material and resources. Uh, you know, during the construction process, incorporating recycling, but also using recycled materials and uh, rapidly renewable materials in the new construction. Um, and the next slide, the next category, and the major one is uh, energy and atmosphere. Uh, keeping, uh, you know, being very mindful, uh, as we've emphasized in the past, of high performance envelopes, so that includes windows, uh, passive heating and cooling, 
natural ventilation, high efficiency HVAC, and uh, also the opportunity for rooftop uh, PV and um, power generation. And then the final category was just the indoor air quality. We want to make spaces that are comfortable for the users, and that includes, uh, you know, the indoor air quality, the quality of the acoustics, uh, the light quality, incorporates uh, daylight harvesting, and being very mindful of each and every product that goes into the building and the off-gassing properties, uh, so you avoid any sort of uh, sick building syndrome. So that sort of broadly <coughs> covers those sustainability issues and the opportunities to address each one of those categories of infrastructure. And Diane, I thought um, also to address one of the questions that's come up in the past is just a comparison of um, building envelope and insulation values for your existing building in Orange. Um, baseline code compliant requirements for, for new construction today. And then um, what we would call high performance buildings where you would really start to see the maximum return on sort of a balance between the efficiency of your mechanical systems and your operations cost and the payback in having reduced operations costs over a longer um, life cycle of the building, um, balancing you know, a, a somewhat higher initial upfront construction cost. So you can see here the slab assembly, um, sort of the most drastic uh, disparity, um, going from R20 for high performance, roughly R10 for code compliant, and then and, and this is sort of an approximation knowing that there is a there are a variety of current um, building assembly types, but there we estimate that a significant number of them actually were not insulated as original slab on grade construction. So you're actually in some places seeing this goes to the comment Perry shared earlier in terms of you know literally feeling the cold air coming through the edge of the slab of the perimeters of your building. You're seeing really only like 26. Um, so moving to wall assembly, we look to have an R40 for high performance buildings. There are a few different ways of achieving per code uh, the requirement, but it would be a combined of R13 with a continuous additional exterior layer of 7.5. So that puts you roughly 23.4. And then we estimate your average current wall assembly isn't actually as drastically bad, but you're probably looking at best case scenario. R14, um, and that also doesn't account any, uh, this doesn't account for air tightness, potential water and et cetera, which further reduces the actual efficacy of these numbers. Going to your roof assembly, um, and, and this actually accounts for a significant amount of heat retention in buildings, especially newer buildings. We, we like to target R60, code requires R30, continuous insulation above your roof assembly uh, and structure, so that means everything is encapsulated. Um, and we anticipate that probably best case scenario, the majority of these buildings are seen 12.5. And that also goes back to the conversation we brought up about um, one of the challenges is it's, it's not as easy as simply increasing the insulation on your existing roofs because that will change um, literally your snow melt and then literally the load that those you see and so a lot of those would require structural upgrade. And then lastly, um, looking at glazing values, we, in high performance buildings, like to target U.2 or better. Um, code general compliance is anywhere from 0.36 to 0.43. And we anticipated that your existing buildings are probably in the neighborhood of 0.55 to 0.65. So again, um, hopefully this illustrates with some clarity, even though the numbers are maybe a little bit hard to process in terms of what they really equate to, the disparity between high performance existing buildings, what would be code compliant? Um, you know, in terms of having a discussion of what would it take to make the existing buildings here or in here. Yes. What is crazy? Crazy would be windows. Oh, skylights. Any kind of glass. Yeah, anything else. Yes. This way. I think it would be helpful uh, just to understand what it would take to get our existing buildings to a 
better place. The types of wall systems that you have to build after and the window replacements? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like we're very quickly giving up on buildings that in the first report that we got <clears throat> back in September um, found that all of the buildings were structurally satis yeah, satisfactory. So we obviously need to improve them and we want to improve them. And so my question is, what would it take to move them above satisfactory to a higher number? So to, to answer that, we have to know two things. One, would we be targeting simply code line based requirements or would we be targeting higher performance? Um, and in either case, the short answer is that it really entails um, pretty much reconstructing the assembly or creating a secondary enclosure envelope on either one side or the other of the assembly. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, in terms of the roof, um, significantly upgrading and reconstructing the structure of the roof. Um, that's what we can quickly tell you without this cannot be improved um, short of essentially removing slab from the inside and putting insulation down and putting down a new one, which would not be a recommendation that most people would make. And to add a little bit more to that, Maria, and thank you for the question. Um, it's it's valid on that. This is always the first question people ask about what we do with improvements here. And that goes back to the earlier slides when Kayla was talking about new construction versus renovation. Go forward, and, uh, and, and Julia touched upon that uh, topic as well to just tackle the insulation on the roof line alone. Yes, you can take insulation and insulate the entire roof and make that better. But the added physical load, all the weight on that, you would have to actually test, test the structural integrity of the roof to whether or not they would hold that on top of the snow load that would be on that as well. And I'll point out one of the SRF applications that we submit that I believe is being considered is a uh, structural roof issue at the high school where the structural capacity of a certain portion of the roof may not necessarily be enough to support an entire full load of snow. Uh, so if you can't support the load of the snow, how can you support additional insulation out there without significant structural reinforcement? And when you're talking about that, you're talking about evacuating a portion of the school for an extended period of time, uh, taking a lot of the wall frames and structures down to a stud and redoing that. that again. And again, going back to the beginning of the presentation, it's a very significant undertaking with also its own, its own uh, uh, corresponding cost as well. If, if we undertook renovation, we'd be required to at least move code, correct? Please, Correct. Yeah, the certain percentages, like if you affect a certain percentage of the building, that triggers other code compliant issues as well. Um, you know, if you just do a small portion of the building, you're fine with leaving everything sort of grandfathered as it is. But over time, you know, they, you know, say for instance, you renovate more than 40 percent of a building. That's just a, a, an example. These are different baselines for any kind of application. You would be forced to tackle the rest of the facility. And then with that, the money invested into that starts to creep up significantly. What we were also doing was. So, this is sort of an oversimplification, but does this sound accurate from what I'm hearing? That though the buildings in that initial report were considered satisfactory, which doesn't sound so bad, to actually improve them is a huge challenge. And, um, not easily done. For the straightforward answer, yes, that's correct. And that's an over Correct. I mean, you, you have a building. It can be, be repurposed and used for any number of different applications. Um, but you still have an issue of, if you, if you were to no longer use this building as a school, you would still need a school for your students to go into. We, right. we, do, we don't want to completely discount the value that these buildings do have um, but when you consider money invested in renovating these buildings versus money that would be invested in potentially doing new construction, um, it's, it's just only fair to look at what you're really, what you're looking at in terms of what you're getting from building performance standpoint for either of them. 
and that's and that's also um, uh, your as part of your charge that, that Dr. Wolfram pointed out earlier is the course of action that you should take. Our job is to provide all the options for you to consider. Um, and just for the sake of time, I think we'll keep moving forward here, um, just continuing with the uh, energy usage of the building. I think we're going to talk about sort of the team's workflow. I could just build on that one more thing. It's, um, the, uh, to answer your question, is the dollars per square foot to get above code in the environment we want to do um, would come, you know, again, I'm guessing probably within 30% of what it would cost to build new. And then you've already got this you know, a layout that's not ideal, as Perry pointed out last time, this long, drawn-out building with a very inefficient energy shape to it. And in order to do that renovation, you have to add the cost of temporary trailers on top of that. And as soon as we started adding all that up, it just pointed to, yes, they are structurally sound, and they'll stand up for a long time. Um, but when you add all that up, pretty soon you're darn near the cost of the brand new building, which is why we need to store it. And we would still have a major security issue. We would still have a cafetorium with five lunch periods of 20 minutes each. So this is an opportunity to address those issues as well. Um, this is a cool slide because I'm an engineer and I'm a geek. So <laughs> James is going to cut me off pretty quick. All right. and I said, nice and Perry, we, uh, we got some really great energy usage data. And uh, the, three, the three little bullets on this, on this uh, to the right are, are the most important ones. Um, so right now, your high school, the high school uses 75,000 BTUs per square foot. Pond codes at roughly 120, it makes sense. The building's a little bit older. As Perry pointed out, it was a great thing to be said. The shape of the building is just, it's not doing it. You, really, you, need, to, you need short and squatty and you need it to build up so the heat stays in and, and, and any wasted heat in one floor goes up through to the next one. Um, so the median, you can see on the graph, the median is 68.7 thousand BTUs per square foot. So if we look at that and think, hey, the high school's not doing too bad, right? Okay. Well, remember the high school on our chart that we've been showing you all along still has 15 years of life left in it. Um, so that's okay. Um, the, uh, the near passive um, on the blue charts that, uh, that Julia showed you earlier, we can get that 68.7 down into the 40 to 50,000 range. And that can start to save a lot of money. Insulation is not that expensive, and the return is really, really good. Um, you're all seeing now these new uh, the zip system. Have everybody seen the zip system now? When somebody builds a house, it's you've got the plywood that we're all used to seeing when we were growing up, and now it's all taped. That tape is to keep the air from flushing in and out of your home. All these things. The, the tape is just the start of what you see in new construction practices to tighten up a building. <laughs> um, I'll talk about this all night. So, <laughs> so using using a median of 50,000 BTUs per square foot, just on your energy costs alone for the elementary and middle school, it equates to a savings of $230,000 a year in, in, uh, in heating costs. Tack that on to 1.2 million, or what was, what was the uh, VCT cost? 1.2 million for all, but all, all yeah, for all the schools. You're looking at a really, really, starting to look at some really good paybacks. $230,000 a year off the heating bills is, is worth, worth coming at. Um, that is something the same square foot size? It does. Yes. Yes. So we, we believe that we can right size. Right, so, so if you squeeze the bills down. And that will only include that. Right. This is based on the same size. Thank you. Yeah, try to keep apples to apples up there. That's right. I don't want to talk too much about the high school. Right now, using the same numbers, it would, it would, uh, it would save about 100000 but remember, we're in our current recommendation, we're recommending that the high school will go down the road about 15 years. Let's use it up and use up its, its entire life before you do this. Um, so just one back, back to the $230,000 per year savings. It represents almost 13% over the life of the building, almost 13% savings uh, payback on the building itself. 13, I've mentioned 13% of what? The actual build cost. So, I'm getting that back. do you have a build cost? Pardon? Do you have a build cost? I haven't heard of any build costs. <laughs> so, that's so why I'm trying to figure 13% of what. Um, we've been trying not to do a build cost out there. 
if you, we have the right size of square footage. I understand okay, that. But if we bracket it, it's somewhere between, we, it's probably between 315 and 500 bucks, so $450 a square foot. It's probably between 80 and 156,000, right? For your goals. What did you say the square foot is 300 to 500? 300 to, it's about 350 to 450 um, per square foot. And you're looking at, if we right size the square foot, it's 106. That's 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 I don't know how much we can say. Something less than that. So go keep thinking further with the utility comparison. Um, Harry's been gracious enough to uh, follow the team for the next few slides here. This next one about oil, uh, oil, water, propane, electricity. Uh, it's currently being used by all the different schools here. Kind of goes with what uh, <clears throat> Kayla was saying. I'm not an engineer, but <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give you just a brief overview of what we go through with, in our building. Uh, the high school and Richard's pool, they're all tied together. They, they work off the same heating system, they work off the same electrical system. It's a little bit hard to figure out. These are fairly accurate uh, average prices that we run into it within a year. So the High School Richards School uses about 69,000 gallons of number two fuel oil every year. And the middle school, Onco, uses about 70,233 gallons per year. Uh, I just wanted to point out, only because it's a hot topic for me right now, I'm currently tracking, tracking the number two fuel oil and how it's fluctuating day by day, peaked over 70 gallons, uh, $70 per barrel for the weekend. It topped out at like 72 and a half, perhaps 62 and a half. <laughs> right, so I, I'm, I'm in the process of locking us in for fuel oil. Uh, I buy fuel oil for the town and the school. It's roughly, we buy 120,000 gallons of fuel in, in one shot. So a fluctuation of 10 cents between one day to another, you look at $12,000 difference that can affect the budget one way or another. So it's kind of, kind of a hot topic for me. Uh, the average annual electrical usage, uh, we, we do about six cents per kilowatt hour, which is really good. Uh, we're currently locked into that contract for another two years. Uh, high school, which is school, we're looking at over a million kilowatts per hour. And middle school, on code, 800. 2,000 kilowatts per hour. Average annual water usage, and this includes sewage as well. High school Richard's pool over two, two and a half million, and the middle school pond cove, just uh, 2 million 478,000. The average propane usage. Now we do keep our buildings portions with some propane. Most of it is kitchen. Uh, usage, but the high school and Richard's pool is 26,347,000 gallons. The middle school in Pond Cove is 4,056 gallons. And one quick note that I wanted to add into here is that uh, when we were talking about square footages earlier, if you just want to look at the top number, um, we want to look at the top number for gallons per year for oil, um, square footage for uh, a high school is 165,000 square feet or so, and the middle school is about 106,000 square feet. And recently, in this past year, the middle school used more gallons of oil, and that's 50, 50 plus thousand square feet less of space that it's needed. Just to, again, just putting things in perspective. Yeah. Annual operating costs, per square foot for the high school is figured to be $1.88 per square foot of the building. And the middle school in Pond Cove is $2.17 per square foot of the building. Um, I have spoken with Todd Jepson at Scarborough High School and was working with him and their high school runs at $1.05 per square foot. That's their, that's their best, most efficient building they have. And that's their usage for the square footage as compared to ours. And if they do over school, have just completed their first year, 
um, with their new building, and they're operating at 65 cents per square foot. I'm going to use the example of the Scarborough High School with the middle school, or because it's a little more accurate, the pool's not involved. Um, so if you took the, the 105,000, or I'm sorry, dollar five square, per square foot, and subtracted from the $217, $2.17 per square foot, uh, we were looking at a, a savings difference of $191,000 just in that change alone. operate on our own when we're purchasing fuel for the town or do we belong to like the main education association purchasing cooperative or I, I, we're not use, a, I use a vendor that puts it out to multiple oil companies they, they actually go even out of state with it to try to land us the best price uh, we do not go in with other schools or anything like that but uh, like this current year I think we're locked in for I believe it's a dollar seventy five a gallon so we got a really good price this year. Thank you. Last year was a little tougher. Um, but yeah I'm trying to lock in that good price again this year before things get out of hand in the Middle East. Yeah. On the operational cost you're talking about is that that's just the heating and cooling costs. That is heating, cooling, water, electric, the whole package. So the high school uh, cost would include the cost of the pool? That does not include the cost of the pool. That dollar and eight does not include the cost of the pool. Correct. Okay. What was the savings on the BCT title too? Because if they're talking about savings, 191000 plus whatever the BCT, which doesn't require the account roll and stuff. So right. I'm, I don't think we actually question? ever came to a, a figure for that because it would depend awesome. on the surface of the floor we use. Um, polished concrete is, a, is a, a hot item right now. You'll see a lot of stores, Walmart, Target, they're all going to that. Right? You can actually see where they had BCT tile on the floor and removed it. It's all due to saving costs and overhead. Do you have a ballpark of what it might be? We've got the maintenance cost for all the school systems with $600,000 annually to maintain the BCT. I saw the six plus the one ninety one just by mm -hmm. the maintenance cost that's people largely. Um, it's chemicals. Exactly. It's um, yeah, it, it is What's very labor intensive. All of the uh, that's what I thought. So it's all mostly the, people. Yeah, and all of it's the, chemicals, labor involved. Uh, moving materials. all of the furniture outside of the classroom, shoveling it back in, mm -hmm. staging for many hours. And I also should note there that we crumbled out of downtime for that. Your school is basically unoccupied during the summer months to get that accomplished. Yes. That's it. It makes it difficult. Right. We, uh, I also wanted to point out, back to what we were talking about earlier, this building is valued by main municipal insurance at just a little over $28 million. When you start looking at, I believe it was $12 million just to bring our repairs up to where they need to be, and then throw in what you needed to do for glazing and insulation and roofing and everything else to make it a little more energy efficient, you're now looking at basically doing the work of what the building costs for the value of it. So. Bringing this for an end, just so we can have time to be here for discussion, and further questions, and moving forward. Again, our, our goal here is to provide all the options that we have on the table for you folks. And based on the feedback that we had last time, um, we looked at another scenario where we could do sort of a phase replacement of the schools while still prolonging the life of the high school, which still has, as we showed previously, that previous phase. We have a chart here at the very end, if you want to see other things as well. Uh, the 15 or so years to really kind of jump to the next slide. Um, so we were looking at sort of a replacement of the K-9 school building. It's a spatial concept only, just so folks know we're not going to create oval-shaped buildings um, or anything like that. <laughs> That's not the plan, um, or any kind of plan, really. Uh, 
Uh, but when Kayla was mentioning earlier about any sort of replacement, either if it's a major renovation or if it's an actual building replacement as well, you would lose the you would lose access to this athletic field here, either for construction lay down during a major renovation or if you were to use that as sort of an ideal location for building a new uh, new facility. Um, I'll come back to the slide if you want to jump to the next slide real quick, uh, Julia. Down here in this concept, we would be to renovate, I'll start here with the, sort of the, 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 the straightforward one, is with the high school, you want to do uh, specific renovations to this building to sort of extend the life of it to, to bring it to its end of life, another 15 or so years. That way you're separating out any sort of major work that you do with this building and the high school, so you're not dealing with this 40, 50 years down the road when you have to address these buildings again. You want to make sure that these are all separate. It's like if you own a series of buildings, you don't necessarily want to replace the roof at the same time on all of them. It's very costly, and then you end up in the same situation again 15, 20 years later when you have to replace the roof and go back to the original. Um, so what, this is a phased approach, and I apologize that this is really uh, legible right here. This will all be made available online uh, tomorrow, this week, uh, loaded for everyone to take a look at sort of multi-phase approach to replace the uh, K through 8 buildings here. So starting with the middle school, uh, we would the idea would be to want to build a new middle school in this athletic field while keeping the entire structure of the building in operation. Um, by building a new middle school in this athletic field, you have that available real estate. All the main utilities, the electricity, the water, um, the oil, the boiler plant, that's all located in this corner of the building right here. So all of your underground feeds from your road utilities come in through this way. And those can be intercepted and put into a new boiler plant or a new central utility plant inside of the middle, inside of the proposed new middle school building. Um, so the phase one would be to temporarily remove the athletic field. It will be relocated or brought back in a separate location once all, it's all said and done. Um, the existing 1930s building is a beautiful historic structure, and you would hate to take that away. Uh, one, one item that uh, Julia touched on earlier with the varying slabs throughout the, throughout the facility. This is in 1938 when this was built. This is a section that was built in the 40s, in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Um, the 2004 wing over here in the 1995. Um, uh, elementary school wing as well. So this building has sort of been piecemeal together over the years. And what we touched upon back in November was you have heat and hot water here that's trying to send all of that all the way around this building so that you have the same amount of heat and hot water here as you do right here. It's very inefficient. You just have so much loss there that you're spending an exorbitant amount of energy and utilities getting that there. That's why you see the oil consumption is, new, is more than the high school for this past year. For a small, much smaller building. Um, so you would construct, you want to phase one would be to construct a new middle school here, going to phase two. Uh, once the middle school is complete, um, you would take the current uh, middle school class student population, they would go to the new middle school, you would take the lower school students, you do some limited renovation in the existing middle school, they would then have their classes in the existing middle school for a period of time while the Pond Cove is torn down and a new lower school, Pond Cove School, is built in its place. Um, that way, you can have class going on with subsequent, um, <coughs> subsequent major pieces of construction going on. And also, there's a major education uh, opportunity for, for this as well, for students that want to graduate or have aspirations to become an architect and become an engineer. Um, they need to see this happen right in their backyard without having to go anywhere. Um, and that's something that I mean, we always part. We always have uh, student mentors come into our offices, and the opportunity to really to, to share a building experience with the students and the uh, kids is really it's, it's a good one that you would want to pass up. Um, so you would build a new lower middle, a lower a new excuse me a new lower school here, and once that is complete, um, the, the sort of the temporarily relocated students who spent a year in the existing middle school would then go back to the lower school in this location and then the existing building would be taken down. Um, so you're wondering, now we have this huge space in here. Again, this is all very conceptual. We're just trying to provide a phase option that keeps you in this section of your property on this campus without sprawling everywhere and potentially uh, upsetting any future plans that you have 20, 30 years down the road. 
in the middle of this sort of mixed space, that's where you would have that's where you would have your new auditorium, that's where you would have uh, your new cafeteria, that's where you would have your new gym, and those would be the shared spaces between the two schools in this space. During that year or so where it's temporary, you would still probably use the existing cafetorium, uh, this space here for, for your meals and so on, and just temporary um, um, a temporary setup just to get you through until the new school is built. And then they would be connected by some kind of structure that ties all three of these buildings together, really all four of these together here. Again, maintaining the existing 1930 schoolhouse, whether you wanted to repurpose that into new um, school offices or town offices. Um, additionally, if you have something like a uh, cafeteria or an auditorium in the center between these two buildings, it's an opportunity for um, folks who can be looking hard to come through the front door, you can walk right in and enjoy like, a community event or something like that. That's a little bit more, more detail farther along, but again, this is a, um, just a sample of, uh, as an option that potential direction we could go. Yes, Susan. Um, just looking at this, it, it feels like it wouldn't solve the, the issue of like, the, this, the buildings being so far apart in terms of you know, saving on energy and the flow of heating. So, and that's a great question that you asked that. Um, <laughs> in here, what you do is when you have the new middle school, you have your, <coughs> you have your utility plant to, to, um, to heat and cool uh, the middle school at that point with enough capacity to support the lower school. But when the lower school gets built as well, what you do is you have dual systems in place. So they both feed off of each other. They both communicate with one another. They share the same fuel supply. They share the same source of power. Um, so you wouldn't have that issue trying to send Water, hot water from this corner all the way through around to this corner again. I mean, that's, that was one of the major major points that folks had was, it's too hot in my room, it's too cold in my room, I don't get hot water out of this faucet. Obviously, that's something that would be addressed in a scenario such as this. Yes? You mentioned the placement of the middle school takes into account the existing buildings that are coming in. Mm -hmm. Is that something? Yes, would for some be, of them are anyways, yes. Would it be hugely problematic to move everything away from the 1930s building if we wanted to use it for a non-school purpose? Yeah, uh, that, again, that's, that's a possible option. I mean, again, this is just one, one scenario here. There are a multitude of different scenarios where you can locate different structures and combine them together on this, uh, on this campus. The reason why we put this here is because it seems to be if you want, it would be the most easiest to have a sort of straightforward approach if you wanted to utilize existing space and to really try to minimize as many costs as we can. You have all of this underground work that's here already. You just build a brand new playground on this side, so it makes sense if you want the lower school to be on that side of the site as well. So that way you're not, you know, you spend all this energy to put this playground together now, and you don't want to have a lower school away from that necessarily. Actually, but the 30s, 1930s <coughs> could be a freestanding building, and these two facilities could be connected in the future by the shared facility. The auditorium we wanted to prove a concept where we weren't having to rent trailers, so you didn't have the rental cost and, and all the logistics that go with that and security around rental trailers and everything. Um, it's actually a great segue question into sort of when, when the needs assessment report is finally done and closed up and you move to a study, um, and it would be to study all the options for that, part of it, and pulling it back from the road, making sure that the sight lines from the road are attractive, and, and really figuring it out. But we wanted, again, we wanted to prove the concept that you can do this in a phased approach and not have to rent trailers and, and have all those associated costs. I have a question. Can you go back to the slide that shows the field going? Now, is that field going away temporarily, or with this design, does that field go away permanently, knowing how much that field gets used both with the school and other town sports and everything, do we ever reclaim a space to put that field somewhere? The question is if we fit a field down here in that reclaimed area where we are currently in and on both this, could we fit a field in there? Okay, so. Yeah, it's just sitting on home plate right now. That field gets used a lot. <laughs> no, for sure, and, and understanding that, was, that would be temporary. You know, you have a little, basically, a, think of it as a puzzle piece, you just shift around pieces of the puzzle on the side to see what the most efficient layout would have, not just for locations of the athletic fields, but also for traffic flow um, and bus drop-off, or drop-off and pick-up for buses and, and um, parents coming in as well. 
you know, those sort of factors would be taken into account. Could you elaborate on that? Is it used for baseball or just general play? Well, if you come here during the daytime, they use <coughs> the, uh, uh, the, the gym class. 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 The gym The evening during soccer season is being used. It's being, the baseball team plays there. So it's used quite a bit. Great. Um, and I'll just say, just, uh, I'll, just, I'm on, almost done with these last two slides and then we'll, we'll continue with the question. And obviously the question is not exactly, uh, a brief timeline on what this scenario would look like. Um, the January, February 2020, you say complete needs assessment. The needs assessment is complete. You have that physical document in front of you here. What we would do is we would take all the information from these building committees, committee meetings, and put that in as an additional appendix into uh, an addendum piece to the building. Uh, to the needs assessment. Um, so in the following along with this timeline, in June 2020, there would be uh, um, passing the school budget, uh, an authorization for bond preparation documents. That would take us throughout the following year to 2021 where you would study this site. There would be programming meetings with faculty and staff to say, okay, we've now discussed what, you, what doesn't necessarily work out well for you in the school. What would be your ideal situation here? Um, we would go through and essentially do a design to a certain point on um, see the feasibility and an accurate cost for what that bond would actually look like. So a year from 2020 to 20, June 2020 to June 2021, it would be the bond prepar preparation documents for sizing the bond for the town to vote on whether it would accept or reject it for June 2021. And that would be to replace both the K-3 schools and renovate the high school as well. Again, renovating the high school to last another 15 years, addressing any security concerns that, are, that were pointed out, um, and as well as the phase replacement of both of these schools here. Next slide, please. And then from that point, if that were to proceed forward, between June 2021 and April 2022, uh, you would design both schools and start construction. Um, between May 2022 and 2023, that's when uh, the, the new school and high school renovation would, uh, that's when they would be, that, that's when they would be complete. Yeah, we would design both schools and start construction in April 2022, August 2023, the new middle school would be complete so that you're occupying the new middle school for your fiscal year, your, your, fiscal year, your academic year in the fall of 2023. Uh, um, and then between June 2023 and August 2024, <coughs> the phase two, this would be the demolition portion of the old Pond Cove and build of the new Pond Cove school, that would take place <coughs> in time for students to occupy the school, uh, the new uh, Pond Cove School, lower school for a uh, better term, in the fall of 2024. Sorry, I stumbled on myself there a few times. Um, and with that, I think that's, that, that, is, that is the end of our presentation. But any questions that folks have, I think this, is, this is an ongoing discussion that we have. I believe we have it for 30, so. Yes, um, Julia. So the timeline that we just presented, um, and sort of in introduced by the square foot uh, slide that I, I should have explained or pre um, prefaced in a little bit better detail, but the last time we met with you, we had alternate scenarios also in play where we were looking at potentially doing the high school first. And because of what we found um, in our square footage investigations and also what we learned once we got the bonding information back, it really seems as though the approach to doing the middle school and elementary school first really makes the most sense. That being said, we would highly recommend as part of the overall initial uh, phasing study, we would incorporate contemplation of the future replacement of the high school beyond simply the renovations into that just so that it could begin to be part of the, the broader discussion of the school going forward. In your long, in your long term plan, 15, yeah. 20 years. And, That's you know, a really important point because we want to make sure that we don't make a decision here if you regret in another twenty five years. And that really goes back to to this diagram and the whole conversation of the bigger picture of all of the, the various infrastructural pieces of the town there's overall and how they get phased so that they're not um, overlapping in a way that prevent that prevent hardship or anything along those lines and really make them possible, feasible, um, and and works into the cycle.
questions. <clears throat> yes, Mary. So I have a question of how we can afford all this if Matt started off with a maximum debt today of $27 million. And then you talked about three to four hundred and fifty dollars a square foot for one hundred and six thousand, and maybe you can right size it and make it a hundred thousand. That would be for the middle school alone between thirty and forty-five million. That's a big swag, but that's basically what I'm hearing you say, and I'm hearing Matt say the maximum debt. Is the town can add at this point is 27. 27. <clears throat> so, is it the maximum? I know that a lot of work has to be done, and I understand that. Sure. <clears throat> but I just wonder about whether we should be prioritizing what should be done within a maximum budget or moving forward and putting out something that. I'm hearing we can't do so. That's where I, I, it's my question because I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done, especially the security. But that's just one school. That doesn't include <coughs> renovations to the high school at the same time. And then I also worry about the superintendent being able to manage two big projects at one time. And, and still be superintendent. I manage the school. I've been involved in, in many courthouse renovations in the 60 to 100 million range, and I know that that sucks a lot of time out of folks who are trying to do other things. So I just put those questions on the table because what I want to see is a successful project and a wonderful space for our kids. Um, just not sure how we get there. Based on you bring up a really good point in that NFC is there is there does appear to be a gap there. And given the data we have now, I think we've, we've sort of exhausted where we are and we need a, a little bit more study to figure out, you know, what can the town, what can the town, what what is it, what can they actually do and want to do? How much do we actually you know, need to do this goal? And then, as, as James finished up with a long range plan, you know, maybe, maybe this is the proposal of a, of a 20 year, you know, we do this now, we wait a few years, then we do the next phase, then the one after that is the high school, and, and it goes on. And um, yeah, some homework needs to be done still. Yes. I would argue that this is the first step, though. I think we've taken that attitude, which I, I don't disagree with you at all, man. But it's gotten to us a point where we're stuck with three cars that need replacing at once, or three houses with roofs that need replacing at once. We've heard all the analogies that you guys laid out that make a lot of sense. I mean, I don't have a, I don't think anyone at the table has a firm, concrete timeline or plan, but I think having these conversations is the first step. Um, and if we don't start here, I don't know where we start. Um, my kids will be graduating before any of this happens, which is a bummer, but um, that almost doesn't, it, it matters to me at all. I, I think that the, the um, strength of our communities based on, on what we're talking about in all these slides. And if we can't make the commitment now to do whatever it is that takes that gets us through a 10, 20, 30 year plan, then I don't know why I'm here. So my question is probably for Matt. And so when I'm, I, wanted, I just want to clarify when we're talking about the um, $2,000 debt per capita, um, that would be the maximum recommended to keep our current bond rating? Or, like, why is it a maximum? Because what I believe is that it's not truly a maximum, it's a recommendation. And so I want to have that conversation so that we're not saying, okay, it's $27 million, and that's the maximum, there's nowhere else to go. I want to hear about. And I'm not, because there's a big difference between that 318 million and the 27, and I'm not a proponent of cashing out our college fund. You know what I mean? But there is some, there is some space in between there. Yeah, mostly it's, it's what you're looking at. 
I think we really have to continue to have and focus on is the right sizing concept. Because I think again, pe people in town will really respect that we're 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 right sizing the school for the population that we're going to have, not just now, but what's going to be ten years from now, and, and making sure that the facilities uh, are right sized. And I think one of the slides up there that we could utilize for that is. Is if we go, if we modernize, uh, update, fix, uh, improve, and we can actually get a more efficient square footage per per student, I think that's another positive that we can utilize in, in explaining it to the townspeople. Step one. So that's something that we need to grapple with. Um, 
as a committee. Other thoughts about next steps? Uh, I mean, I don't have any kids in the school, but I do hear from parents that have kids in the school that step one might, or many of them, be a security. You know, and even looking at some of this now, I think you're addressing some of that with the $988,000 that we'll hopefully get. <clears throat> some of those six projects, are they security uh, I don't related? Fully so unfortunately, they're not. No. Um, we we're capped by, there's a, there's a cap on each application that you're able to submit to the state <clears throat> pay for a certain amount of money on that. And the cost to overhaul the front entrance of the building put the administrative offices out front there, really add in your double doors for security where someone comes in and closes and then they're authorized to come into the building. It would have far exceeded the money available in the SRF funds. So in the SRF funds, we're only able to target very sort of small, specific uh, items in the building. We're looking at um, failing precast window sills, uh, roof issues, uh, HVAC considerations, potentially the dust shop of the high school. So. so so my concern about that is that's something I've kind of been a proponent of trying to do something with that right away. Um, and I still feel that way. If, even, even on the, the uh, looking at projecting this out, that wasn't going to get done for a while. But I, I would really feel, even if it's something that's temporary, that's going to ultimately get replaced once we do something else with the building. I, I still see <coughs> that you probably hear, Troy probably hears concern about making sure that the, the buildings get secure. So I, I'd still like to see that uh, in, some, in some way uh, addressed. Any I think safety is a real priority. I don't know what plans are, but by the way, as you may really regret it if we wait two or three years. So I think that's a high priority. The next question I have is are we talking 300,000 square feet or that's what we have right now, right? In between the two buildings, 300,000 square feet. It's 106,000 plus 106,000 plus 165, so about 270, 275,000. And if you and if you rebuild it, I hear 106. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. <clears throat> if you re, if you completely rebuild the school, this is 106,000. Uh, 106,000 is just the uh, Pond Cove School and the Middle School combined. That is this entire structure on this side, 106,000 square feet. Um, we believe with new modern building practices that square footage could potentially shrink while still maximizing the amount of efficiency within the building for uh, classroom, transfer space, storage, and so on. Okay, no, another question I have is, you know we just spent a couple million dollars on this roofing. Do you know what the our, our value is on this roof? So we just did two years, three years ago. According to the 2012 report, <coughs> Um, lists of two and a half inches of insulation. So if we assume that's rigid insulation, then <coughs> those roofs um, at maximum are 12.5 R value. Uh, could you check on that? Because I thought the state had a mandate. Certainly an industrial building, so I don't think my work on is uh, higher than 20. I thought the state had a mandate at least. Check it, but they come up with the right move. So I like to know. We can just we'll look into that. We can submit an answer, Don. If you sign in on the sign in sheet, we'll even we can mm -hmm. submit an answer how uh, everybody has it. Okay. <coughs> Another thought I have over the past couple of minutes is <coughs> what, if, what if we kept the structures as they are, that we spent our money and we place Be a priority, and then look inside the buildings. <clears throat> and what? Let's. <clears throat> uh, what do we do? Have, what do we have, should do? What should we do to improve the uh, living standards, and the classroom standards inside the buildings? We are have spending money inside. <clears throat>
this town can't afford if, if you have all this work for each other. To me, that's one of my inside goals. <clears throat> improve the efficiencies in the uh, laboratories at El Saro or at the uh, high school air ops and then uh, take care of the teachers.
changing anytime soon. A lot of it's uh, labor driven in the marketplace. Uh, materials are fairly stable for the most part, other than, say, a few things that, that tariff related items. Um, we have a labor shortage in our state, not just in construction, but in a lot of other industries. But construction has really hit hard in the last 10 years or so, I'd say, when we had our last recession. Uh, what was, they said today we lost a quarter of our uh, labor force in the, uh, since the last recession. So, and the labor force we do have is very old, averaging 55 or older. So young people are not going into the <laughs> trades. Um, so the cost of construction is not going to go down. Unfortunately, most of the costs are labor. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what I can tell you other than it's going to keep going up. And, so, yeah, and so to a point that Scott made in our team meeting, by postponing this decision, it's only going to get more expensive. Do you remember off the top of your head? Did the first go around and you guys actually come up with some concept ideas of new cafeterias out here, new safety, you know, costs? The total cost of that? So I didn't think you came up with the total cost. There were, there were some estimates that we had in the, again, in the initial go around, we go, and we had that in Thailand earlier, where fall 2017, spring 2018. Mm -hmm. I think those were in the $30 million. I thought so too, right? So, so yeah, that, that involved uh, essentially your. And those concepts are all available online for people to go back and take a look at. But that was a brand new cafeteria uh, in the courtyard space between the two schools. And they would be taking this current cafetorium and renovating and changing it into a brand new auditorium for this space. As well as a complete overhaul to the front entry where you're moving the administration offices to the front entrance uh, and making that a lot more secure. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that was, right, that was the purpose of uh, that, that exercise. So that was the $30 million rate. But again, um, if that's the course of action to be taken, um, what, would be, what the next step is, and as far as the design standpoint is for sort of a bond support package where we include design drawings and 3D measures of what it would look like. We would go into, we spend a significant amount of time and hours investigating the current market and cost for a lot of this, uh, a lot of this construction work. And that would give you your cost for what your actual bond would be like to finish the design and build it the following year. This is all a, a very staged approach where you have your initial study to see, okay, say for instance you want to completely overhaul this building. The first thing we would do is we would look at what would need to be done to this building to overhaul it. We've done a lot of that already, but now it would be the point of all right, what specific down to the detail items that we're going to be doing here. What, what's not necessarily, necessarily a brand, but um, specific items that we would install in here that would help drive the cost, uh, <coughs> indicate what that cost would be for a bond following that you would vote on and then proceed with construction at that point. So you need that upfront effort uh, to study that. Yeah, I, I, so I really wasn't built to sort of bring that up as an alternative to what we're thinking about doing, but I, I kind of just want to float that number out there thinking that. That was something that was proposed that didn't involve renovating any part of any of the teaching spaces in the school. It's strictly the sort of day-to-day -day running of a new kitchen and a cafeteria and the safety that Tim has been talking about in, in both of these schools. And and that's a lot of money right there. Right, right. Um, so. Can I go to actually the parity that uses that? I just wanted to point out that when, when we did that uh, first figure, that was given, that was prior to the study, and does not include the estimated 12 million that needs to be done, the million, 7 million of the work that needs to be done at the high school. So <coughs> that would need to be factored in as well as far as the mechanics are concerned. Okay. Um, and uh, just thinking along the lines of Steve, in terms of possibly plan B's or plan C, um, I know there's costs associated with temporary classrooms, but perhaps we should be consider that. If, in my mind, the oldest and most dilapidated in the one building that needs the most attention, <coughs> has the most problems, is the middle school. So, in my mind, what if we moved the middle school students and teachers into temporary um, classrooms for a year, tore this down, and built in the middle a new middle school that connected that much closer to the elementary school? 
and then we fix the problems associated with safety and cafeteria and all that. Would that have any reduction in estimated cost for doing that? Or would that just be equal? The, the only issue, and from an engineering standpoint, the only issue if you wanted to just do the middle school only and leave the pond middle, <coughs> lower middle, the lower school in place is that most of your utilities come into the middle school right, right actually right through over here. This is where your boiler plant is, this is where your electrical services that, that takes care of the entire building. You would have to construct a new boiler plant or a new electrical <coughs> service to feed the other school, uh, at least temporarily, while the new middle school is being constructed. And you would potentially still have the issue of but you would move the schools closer together, but the middle school is sort of the, uh, the heart that sort of pumps the blood through the rest of this building. But that is an option. I mean, really, the, if you want to look at three options here, one option is to sort of do nothing and to sort of maintain, as, you're, as you have been over this time, which uh, from the, the vibe of the audience here is, is probably, probably not an option. Um, the second option is to go through a substantial renovation um, we had mentioned that earlier in the slide that involves the temporary relocation of students and classrooms, portables, finding locations for all of that, working on the services. And it's not just classrooms, too. Uh, it's bathrooms, it's where they're going to be for the cafeteria area, uh, where are students going to play at a sort of instrument, <coughs> performances, where is all that going to go? You know, that have to all of a sudden transfer everything over to the high school for that effort. Um, and also uh, the third option, which we mentioned as a potential one tonight at the very end is the phase replacement, complete replacement of these buildings here. So those are, again, sort of your, your, your primary options at, at, at this point. Yes? I'd like to piggyback a little bit on of Susanna's <coughs> question because there might be a misunderstanding that having the new buildings, if that's the way we happen to go, where they're situated somehow still costs too much money to move HVAC and water and that sort of thing. And my understanding is that that's not the case. That you'll have dual systems that are more efficient and just having the buildings physically closer together wouldn't necessarily save us any money. In that, in that particular scenario, if you were to go through the phase of the construction, uh, yes, you're correct. That would, those would be designed into play where you would not have the issues of not having hot water on the other side of the building, not having enough people who on the other side of the building. Those would be addressed in the process. An advantage to having the two buildings close, closer together from a utility standpoint is when we look at a school or a commercial building and we keep somebody up and running, we don't want to just design just one boiler for 100% of the load on the coldest day of the year. <coughs> Ideally, we'd love to have two boilers sized at about 60%. So we've got some redundancy. If one of the boilers goes down, the other one can keep the, keep the building at a certain temperature and keep it running. By building the buildings closer together, you could potentially have, we want them to have independent, independent plants. You know, basically they could heat and cool themselves, run independently. Um, but in the event that one was down, you could open up the valve and, and feed it the other way and keep the building from freezing. Um, as soon as you freeze a building like this, <coughs> All the places where everything the pipe comes in gets heaved up, and things start, but thing, bad things start happening. So it's really just like our homes; keeping them from freezing is, uh, is, a, is a big deal. So yes, there are advantages to that. I have a question about the K through 12 model. You, it looks as if you were looking to have it be a project would be like a four-year project. Is that okay? So I'm just looking at option one from the middle, <coughs> and it, in order to make this maybe financially more palatable, and again, nobody knows what this is going to cost, the new elementary school will be a three-year project, and the middle school will be another three or four-year project, and the high school would be on top of that. So you'd stretch the whole thing out another 10 years, and that might, might, if we knew what the numbers were, it might make it more palatable financially, just to sort of do, do financial modeling something looks like that. I think that's Versus what, yeah. what, excuse me? I made some notes when Mary Ann was, was uh, giving her comments that to that very right. extent is maybe, and, and then working with Matt to see if maybe that phase plan that we proposed in four years stretched that out over a longer period of time so that, <clears throat> excuse me, it works in with other bonding that you want to do for the town, whether it's a 
to do the fire station proposal or doing some sewer and, and street work. Right. And just making sure that there's a 20 year plan financially. <coughs> so that when, if you're putting this up for a vote and trying to convince everybody, hey, vote for this, you can show a plan that's financially viable. That's actually a really great idea. One thing, if I may add to that too, is um, South Portland was able to get state funding for that, which is, is typically, um, I would say, highly unlikely or, or, or understood that they would have a very challenging uh, um, time getting that funding, but they did. And they're next door neighbor here. Granted, the application process for the state of Maine funding is closed. The last was open is 2016, but during, for instance, during this potential four-year period, at any point that could reopen again. It's not, it's unknown when the state of Maine is going to open up that application process again for, for new applications for new projects. Um, but between now and that 2024 or beyond, during the process, if it opens up, you can still apply for all of those funds. And if another SRF funding opportunity comes up, you apply for that as well. As the, it's, 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 instead of waiting for the, it's necessarily the process to happen, if you want to continue to move forward, the worst case scenario is you prepare to take on the burden by yourself. But ideally, or, or, or hopefully, during that period, there would be an opportunity for the state of Maine that would open up a, another funding revenue stream that could, that could be used for that. Is, my, is that close but, but James, isn't it true though that there is this ranking um, and there is a scoring system that has to do with structural failures and hazardous material and so forth? And just the sheer fact that if you look at the statistics of the amount of funds granted to projects, the likelihood is in the five percent range. Right. And, so and that's absolutely correct, but. <coughs> South Portland was also consolidating schools as well, which right. where on the application process on that checklist that records a lot of points that add application, where you already have two schools essentially combined together. But and and I agree that is a very low prob probability, but you still need to do the due diligence to send an application. You still have to try because it, there there could be a chance that it might happen. And I think you owe that to the taxpayers to say we've exhausted this possibility and it's right. not possible. <coughs> no, no, it's okay. I was saying you might find in the next program, instead of just three three schools getting huge chunks of money, maybe they spread it out over twelve schools, and it, it helps us bridge the gap. You know that you know if we need an extra five million or eight million to make the program work, maybe that's there or it helps out in reducing the bond bond debt to the town. Right, other revenue streams, or if it's a a, a, a long high group of uh, cables with students or looking forward and, and going and talking to your legislature. I think it was it back in the 70s or the 60s when a lot of these schools were built, a lot of funding was granted to support the building of new schools. Granted, that's gone away, and now we're looking at three out of 75 applications being accepted for major capital projects, but it's a new administration that can potentially change. Any other questions? Going, going, going. Okay, so we do That will be back in the high school uh, in the library. And uh, I'd like to thank Colby. You have given us a lot of information tonight to think about. And um, I'm sure that we'll be all going home and pondering this for the next month. Um, we'll get together. We have a lot to talk about. Um, we may have a recommendation at the end of the next meeting. We may have to meet again to keep talking, and that's OK. It's worth spending the time to get it right. So I want to thank everybody for coming and we will see you on the